together. That's all there is to it. Um, but it don't matter. We're here tonight. And there's some unbelievable godly men here uh, tonight. Uh, God, John Bradley's here. And we've been praying for him. We're going to pray for him tonight. And, and his illness. And, uh, oh, man, there are so many sexy preachers here tonight. Trey Waller. I mean, man. You got my boy D. Hart from Cotton Valley with the flowing locks. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and just good, good, good Christian men all around this place. Uh, Preston Young comes from Castor. Uh, he's a preacher at a church in Castor, Louisiana. And, uh, man, I don't know if Cotton Valley has anything on Castor, buddy. <laughs> both Cotton Valley and Castor get in this epic battle, and I don't know who would win. It'd be rough, man. Be a lot of dead bodies. Doug Culpepper. Be a lot of people with those big knives you got sticking holes and stuff. Look at Cole back behind you, man. He don't know what to think about everything. But anyway, so, I mean, Austin, Austin Cole. Hey, look, so uh, I want to do something right now. Kevin's waving at me before I lose track, and Tommy gets real mad at me. So, listen, you know, like last year, I'm not going to go over all these numbers, but there's one that the men just so much love. Is uh is we did 43 totally free wheelchair ramps last year, and I know you're like, hey Chris, we've heard that number. Get off that number, you know. But the only way we can do, I mean, God provides. There's no doubt. These preachers can say it so much better than this redneck Cotton Valley. God provides. God puts the money in. Mike tell him, but He does it through men. You know what I'm saying? He can do anything he wants. He can make that bank account change trade, but that's not really the way he does it. You know? He tells men and women to give. To bring it into the storehouse. Um, and I don't expect anybody here to buy any more of these. Because I bet everybody here has bought some. But you have some, you can you can talk to somebody to buy one for, uh, for us. Do you have a business that maybe you work for that would think about buying some? Can you sell some for us, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Because um, this is the way we're funding this ministry. We feel like it's a neat way. way we, it's a neat way for men to be able to give their tithes, if you will. But you also, we might win a gun. So how much better redneck does that get? You know what I'm saying? Drop a tithe and maybe you get a gun, Preston, you know. Anyway, so we're doing that. But tonight, um, we had an anonymous donor that gave us, he bought a lot of tickets and then he gave them to us. So, but this was the theory. Like, tonight we're going to give a ticket away as a door prize, period, later tonight. But if you go see Kevin tonight, and you buy one, you get a chance in the bucket to win another one tonight. And then if you buy, I think it's five tonight, you get one for free. So that's the way we're doing. But, again, all I'm asking is, now I'm not even asking you to buy any more of these things. I guarantee everybody's like, I bought them. But can you help us sell these? Can you help us sell these? I am asking that. Can you help us sell these? So uh, I want to talk to you about next month, February. Uh, man, I went to a beast feast the other day that was off the chain good. They had fried, fried frog legs. And I think I ate about 10 pounds of them, man. They were so good. And this teenage kid had fried those. And, man, they were so good. So, look, February, Brian Steele's fixing a freak out. He don't even know I'm going to say this, Robert Chandler. He ain't going to be able to sleep tonight. But February, and I'm sorry, Big John, we're going to be using you a bunch more. But in February, we're going to do a true beast feast here. If you got squirrel, bring it. If you got sausage, bring it. If you got fried turkey, bring it. If you got frog legs, bring it. If you got crappie, bring it. If you don't got any of that, go down there to Louisiana Chicken and bring some fried chicken. You know what I'm saying? And we are going to do the deal where Jesus said, how many, we, what we got? And somebody said, we got five fish. And I might be getting numbers wrong, Preston, but we got five fish and two loaves of bread. And I'm going to laugh about the numbers later. And he just said, that we got this. And so we're just going to truly rely on February for there to be a bunch of tables. With, and you label your stuff, and let's see who's got fried crane or something crazy that y'all thought of that nobody's going to eat. Fried snowbird, I don't know what. Uh <laughs> <laughs> those those ducks, those black ducks, that some cotton belly boys kill. <laughs> anyway, whatever we can, whatever we can eat, y'all bring it. In February, I'll put out some more information on Facebook about all that. I want to I want to thank again. I want to do it. I want to do a thank, and I want to ask for a little bit of help. Sean Lewis is in the back, and he has agreed 
needs to run our sound system for us. And he's doing a phenomenal job doing this. Um, and he's also, man, he's, he, he, he's got a manufacturing experience behind him. Uh, I think you're an engineer, are you not? Is that what you? So he, like, and, and the living word gave us a bunch of equipment. Thank God for that. That was awesome. So we have our own equipment, and Sean took it and just kind of packaged it up really neat where it breaks down, and, and we put it together. But, and, and Terry Skaggs has been helping, and um, Rick, Rick Buckner has been helping. But if there was a couple of men tonight can help break down, and then I'm going to go a little bit extra. This is just what John Bradley does when he's healthy. If you could get with Sean and maybe start just four or five men, just maybe start a little group text. Hey, Sean, when are you getting to the Civic Center? You know, I'm getting there at four, I'll help you, blah, 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 and I'll help put it up that night. That would be huge if there's a couple of guys that would do that. I'm just asking for volunteers. Get with Sean when it's over. Maybe a couple of guys can help us break it down. Okay, and then uh, I got Bibles back here on the table for people. And some of them I'd hope that maybe they'd be here tonight or maybe that somebody knows the name of those Bibles and you get it to them. Sometimes the hardest part that, that I get the request from Facebook Messenger or text or through a lot of people, Jerry, hey, will you get my two cousins a Bible? But I don't know the two cousins and I really don't know the guy that's asking me to get the two cousins a Bible. So it gets to be a little complicated, but I'll always figure it out. But if you know somebody's name back there, Get, go ahead and take them to the Bible. That would be a bold and courageous thing to do um, as a Christian. Uh, so look, tonight we got Cade Contreras. I hope I'm saying Cade's last name right. We got him coming tonight, and he's got a partner singing with him. Um, we got uh, Luke Hockey Josh, one of the greatest. I learned this the other day. I learned this. Some guys from California had came in. Mark Rogan had got them in for Bozier, and they do... Living water, somebody help me, Luke. Well, where are Luke talking to us? Somebody, what do they call it? living water? Anyway, okay. So Luke was there with me. You see how much he listened. So um, they had this big ministry in California, and and it was funny because we were in a room. We were and Mark Rody put this on for us, and it was about men trying to train men to go out and evangelize. Evangelize, I guess is the proper word, maybe. Evangelize, Preston. Tell people about God and Jesus. You know what I'm saying? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only God and Son. Whosoever believed in Him shall not perish. John 3, 17, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And John 17, 3, This is eternal life. And this is Jesus doing this. This is eternal life, dear heart. That you know the one true God, and you know the one He sent, Jesus Christ. And that no, we know there's a lot... A little bit to that no, but you know what I'm saying. That's what Jesus said. So Mark wrote it. It was an awesome thing. He got us in this room with these guys. And I, I'm not making fun of this. I'm just telling you, big time preachers go all over the world. But I was looking around, and, and I don't. Some of y'all are gonna know this, but Mark Rose is in the room. Luke Hawk just in the room. This guy Chris Terry's in the room. There, the, there's I man. I want to tell you this. He said that day. Now there are 12 chapters of Men of Courage. And so they all do this pretty much the same thing. One night a month, it's crazy. All the nights, something's going on. Red River has one. Um, i got to get to it more this year. But anyway, 12 chapters. So listen to this. Rody said this. There's over uh, approximately, depending on the numbers, and I know we don't have all the numbers tonight, but, but approximate numbers that meet all these, there's approximately 3,000 men each month that hear the gospel through these men of courage chapters. Is that not a huge deal? That's a huge, huge deal, okay? So, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get back to this. But I was looking around the room at all these guys that I know from these men of courage. We've been on a mission trip to Mexico, and we've done all this. So this guy, he labeled it. He called it open-air preaching is what he said, Trey. And I never thought of it, and I was like, but he was talking about, like, and I'm not trying to brag me, but, like, when we do, when we meet at the uh, tree, the ash tree, He's talking about open air preaching. When some of y'all preachers do something on that red brick road, he's talking about open air preaching. He's talking about God and Jesus telling you to go outside and talk to a man right now about him and his son Jesus. And he called it open air preaching. And I was looking around the room going, oh my gosh. And it was all cool. And we did learn stuff from him. But I'm like, man, you got some of the greatest open air preachers in this room right now. It's crazy. Awesome. But, but you know, that's, that's what God wants us all to be. 
is, is open air preachers. You're at your work. You're well, my man, Austin. Sometime during the day, y'all gonna be talking about stuff. Does, and he does, Austin, but does he know you're a Christian? You know what I'm saying? These are, these are not complicated conversations, but the devil wants to, don't do that. Don't talk about that. Don't say that. We got to get better. I love the way the man said that. Open air preaching. Open air preaching. Not, not, not on Sunday. And I want you all to go to church on Sunday. The next thing is, this year, Big Joe Morgan. Man, y'all didn't lead us in a prayer. I'm going I'm to do it at the end. So what we got tonight, we got, we, and of course I've talked a little bit, and I got one more thing I'm going to say. Tommy's already shaking his head. Get off stage. But anyway, uh, then we got Kay, and then we got Luke. So I'm going to do a prayer at the end of this to start us off. But listen, because I got all out of order as usual. Sammy Waller, it's not as easy as it looks, man. I know I make it look easy. It's not. No, I'm joking. So anyway, um, open air preaching. I want to go back. I got for some reason I want to go back, and I want to. This year, God's been talking to me about this is you, Chris. This is your path, and it's the same path He's been giving us. And some of y'all had to hear this over and over again. God wants me and this ministry, and the Tommies and the Kevins and the Bryans, and whoever else in here that's really you know the the the, the, the support, the backbone, the ministry tray. We are supposed. This is what we're supposed to be doing, man. Encourage. We're supposed to be equipping and empowering and encouraging men to go that much closer to Jesus. That's what we're supposed to be doing. I, I may get off a little bit last year from that, but that's what we're supposed to be doing. And I'm back home, and all I want to do is help a man. So some of y'all, and man, I, you know what, I'm not going to say your name, so I'm not going to embarrass you. Some of y'all are the, the man that's had it figured out for a long time. And, and maybe you're this far from the flag from Jesus. And of course, you can still make a little step. But some of us are way back there against that wall. But still, can you do that much for Jesus? That's a huge deal. So that's what we want to challenge each other to do. And it made me think, y'all, some of y'all heard this story. This is the last story. And Kay will go, but it made me think of this time. And I've told this story a couple times before. It was a big, it was a big deal in my mind when it happened. I signed up for the school to get to go, if you get good at this school, you get to go to one of these special army trainings. And but it was one of those deals where you had to do something really tough to just get to go to the tough school. <laughs> and at that time, man, I was raising my hand to get tortured all the time. I was a torture magnet. Torture me. And um, so it was basically it was a three-day course. And in the army, they call it land nav, meaning uh, they'll give you, a, and this was old times, they give me a latitude and longitude, and I had to have a map, my little compass, and you head out somewhere in this topo topographic map, and you want to stay on those ridges. You get down to one of those little hole things that goes down, you're in trouble, man. And some of y'all probably don't have a clue, and I'm probably not explaining explain very well, though. But I know those little hole things that go down and up, they're bad, man. But anyway, so three days, you, they gave you what you had to put in your rucksack, and it, they know it's going to equal to about 50 pounds. And they give you first coordinates, but they don't tell you. There's many things. It's a neat, 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 neat process. They don't tell you how long you got to get to the next spot if you can find the next spot. So, I mean, you might run and make it by two minutes, or you made it by 30 minutes and you didn't have to run that far. So, that's a big deal. You don't know how long it's going to take you. Really, you can estimate all you want. And then when you get there, they give you your next spot, but they might do, uh, hey, let's do so many push-ups, let's do so many sit-ups, do something else to stress you, and then give you your next spot. You might show up at a range, a firing range, do some cheating, then they give you your next spot. So you go all the way through the day, all the way through the night, don't get me wrong, they might pull you at one of them and go, okay, you got two hours for your next, your, your next uh, numbers, so, so take a little nap. When you, we'll call you when you, need, when you need your next latitude, longitude. So this goes first day, first night. Second day, six night, but I'm telling you, man, y'all are going to get some of this. When you don't know how long you got to get to that next spot, I mean, you just keep moving. Next day, next night, next day, and that night, and you knew it was going to be over, but you don't know, like, is it going to be over at midnight? It's going to be over at two in the morning. It's going to be over at daylight. So, you mean, you're done. And so many guys have dropped out. This is one funny story. This, and I've already made this too long, but... uh. We, we were all set of rucksacks down. We were, some you know, guys get in two minutes. Another guy walks in two minutes later. And they had the rucksacks all sit down because we were resting a minute. They gave us time to rest. And, man, that, 
Sarge went by kicking those rucksacks, sacks, and he kicked this one, and he went, poof. Dude had a pillow in there, d Of course, he was gone. But um, I was kind of mad because I didn't think about that, but then I was glad because I didn't get out. But anyway, so um, you come to this last spot of the night. It was, it was 2 or 3 in the morning, and it was cold, and you're done. And when you got to that, you started coming down this big hill, big open field, and there was a trailsway bus there. And they already had some rucksacks up in the trailsway bus. And you know how it looks with that warm fog inside. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I just need to get in there. Oh, it's going to feel good sitting down. Man, this is over. I did it. I can't believe I did it. If I made my time, this is what I did it. And you get there, and you walk up, and it was a, a, just a light. And the lieutenant's waiting there to give you your next coordinates. And you walk up, and you're just waiting for him to go, Good job, son. Put your rucksack under there. I mean, there's the belly of that trailsway right there, you know. Ooh. He says, all right, here's your next latitude longitude. What? Yeah, son. You, I ain't going to say it twice. Okay. And you start off, and you're even looking back at him like, well, come on, man. No, hey, you need to get it. Okay. And then, like I said, there's a couple before and a couple after, and you're kind of waiting there just a second trying to get your map right, figure out where you're going, little red glow stick. And them dudes said, hey, here's your next latitude longitude. And them dudes said, no. <laughs> I'm getting on this bus. I'm getting on this bus. I'm done. And then I went about two more miles down the road, and there was the real Trailsway bus waiting on you. But that was their last little trick to see if you was going to stop and quit. So, man, for some reason, this, is, this story's been in my head a bunch lately because I, I just feel like, and I feel like God put me through that three days because of now and like life, God told me, Chris, here's your next coordinates. I ain't telling you how to get there. I ain't telling you what you got to get to get there. I ain't giving you the boom, 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 boom to get there. I need you at your next coordinates. Yes, sir. And then when you get to those next coordinates, God says, because I think he's got a live one, DJ. Hey, this guy just said yes. When he gets to the next coordinates, give him this. Yes, sir. And all of 2024, all I want to do, I promise y'all, is just give me those next coordinates. How you getting there? I don't know. What you got in that rucksack? It don't matter. I'm getting to those next coordinates for God and Jesus somehow. And I'm challenging y'all to get to those next coordinates this year. Let's do this in 2024 like we've never done it before, Luke. More than we've ever done before in 2024. And I promise y'all, that's what I'm going to be trying to do. Encourage, empower, and equip men to get that much closer to Jesus Christ. Okay, come on up here and play for us. It's good to see y'all in January, man. Man, I'm so scatterbrained. Y'all know this by now. Let me say a prayer for us tonight. I'm going to be praying for some people. I'm going to be praying for Mike Wise and his family. I'm going to be praying for Joe Morgan. Chris Purvis is in the house tonight. Big old strong dude. I'm going to be praying for John Bradley. And, uh, man, there's a million of these prayer requests that come through my head. I'm not going to remember them all, so please forgive me. But uh, anyway, here we go. Lord God Almighty, heart in heaven, God, thank you so much for these bold, courageous men tonight, God, that that uh, weathered the storm to come out uh, to eat some gumbo, God, to fellowship with each other, God, to hear some good Christian music that's going to that's gonna praise your name tonight, God. And, and, and I know, God, I've been praying today. You've already gave Luke Cock and Josh something that you're going to give him, and it's going to roll off his tongue to us from you. And I'm just so thankful for him. I'm so thankful for his ministry. Give him Jesus. I beg you to bless that man and bless his finances and bless his health. Bless his wife, Olivia. Bless Josie, his daughter, God. Bless everything he does. He's b battling for you every day, God. Thank you for John Bradley being here tonight, God. Thank you for John Bradley, what he means to us, God. Thank you, God, for Joe Morgan being here tonight, God. He looks so good, God. He looks so good. Thank you for that. God, please be with Chris Purvis. Let him know how much we love him, God. We love this man so much. He has drawn so close to you, God. He, is, he has just walked step after step after step closer to you, God. And I've got to see it, and it has strengthened me so much. I'm begging you to be with Chris Purvis. God, be with Mike Wise and his family tonight, God. I don't, I, 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 that's something I don't even know how to talk about. Be with him and his family and his wife and his other kids, God, and just help them, God, and they're... Oh, to some degree, maybe despair, God. I don't know if that's a proper word, God. They're hurting, God. They're just, uh, I don't know, God. But I'm begging you to be with him tonight, God, and love him and lead him and guide him, direct him, and 
Jesus, put your arms around him. God, there's so many prayer requests in this room tonight. Be with them all. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you for carrying that cross to Golgotha until you literally just, your body gave out. You're 100% man, 100% God, but your body gave out, and you just wanted to carry it so bad for us, for all of us. Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Who's glad to be here tonight? Amen. Amen. I just want to start out by saying thank you, Chris, for having us tonight. It's such a blessing and honor to be here tonight. Um, if y'all want to stand up on your feet, we're about to go into praise and worship. Come on, y'all sing this out. Lord of all creation. The heavens are a tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. Everybody sing it out. Come on. God wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy. Holy. The universe declares your majesty.
spoken word, you sing it over me. And you have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you read your life in me. Been so so kind to me. No, sing it out. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I found these ninety-nine. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve. Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God yeah, yeah. Oh, the words you paid it all
don't know who he's talking about. Nah, no, we're, we're all young, young man. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna throw a bag with a hymn here, so I want y'all to sing along with it. We're gonna sing "He Touched Me." So. Oh, he touched me. Oh.
Amen. Y'all doing all right? Good deal. Mm, I don't know if I'm going to like that. Give me one second. Can I move this? Y'all doing okay? Good deal. Thank you so much for laughing at me. And uh, out of a hundred something guys, only one, one guy, guy offered, offered to help. help. Appreciate, Appreciate that. that. <laughs> and, and it was Chris, Chris Plants, and he needs more, more help than all of us. us. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do something, something uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to get into just what God's put on my heart. It's, it's my, my first time, time to be here, here since uh, the things that went on in October. And I just want you to hear my heart in this because I feel like. There's a lot of you that may be thinking the same thing that I, that I was thinking. And so I love pulling band-aids off of things. And I also know that if you don't handle things privately in humility, then God will humiliate you in public to handle what he wants done in private. And that's kind of where I am tonight. I should have handled something in private, and I didn't. And so now I'm handling it in public. Chris Plants, I love you dearly. And you know, dang well, I didn't agree with what went on in October. But according to what you've told me, is that you've repented of those things. And I was reading in Luke chapter 17, and I was thinking about what to preach here. And I came across Luke chapter 17, verse 3. It says, Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, I repent, forgive him. Chris Plants repented of the things that he did in October. And there's a lot of people that didn't want me to come here tonight to preach. And I came across that verse in my study, and I realized that if I claim to be a follower of Christ, and a preacher of the Bible, not just the passages of Scripture that are fun to preach, but the whole Bible, then I have to forgive Chris Plants for the things that went on that I might not have agreed of because he repented and because he is my brother, therefore I am to forgive him. And so I want it to be known in public that I forgive Chris Plants and I love him dearly and I believe that God has a great plan for him and a purpose for him. And if you call yourself a believer in Jesus Christ and you're still holding things over his head for what he has done, then you are not a follower of God's word if you will not forgive him for what he's done. And you need to repent of what's going on in your life. Amen. How many of you are history buffs? Anybody? Or you're all Baptist, so you don't really raise your hands. Anyways, uh, any, any history buffs out there? And I have some dates for you. What happened, and you can answer out loud, that's perfectly fine. What happened December 7th, 1941? There you go. All right, what happened, and I wrote it down just so I wouldn't forget and look like a, a, a dummy. June 6th, 1944. D-Day. What happened September 11th, 2001? 9-11. Our country was attacked. People flew into the World Trade Centers. Thousands of people lost their life. D-Day, thousands, 150,000 plus soldiers stormed the beach. Many of them lost their life. Pearl Harbor, thousands of people lost their life. What happened March of 2020? COVID-19. The world shut down, many people lost their life. See, what, what I've noticed about us is that we remember things that happen in our history that really impact our present. But what if I was to ask you what happened in the year A.D. 30, between A.D. 30 and 33? Right. See, many of us may know that Jesus Christ died between those years, right? We, we believe when he was born, that started our calendar year, right? The year of our Lord is when that happened, when Jesus Christ was born. And, and even in all the people of the world followed that calendar, right? Well, many of us know what happened on Pearl Harbor. We know what happened on D-Day. We know what happened on 9-11. Many of you probably even know what happened way before that, but I didn't have enough time to cram in all of your history desires to get to this. But how many of us truly know what happened on the day that Jesus Christ 
was led, led like, like a lamb led to slaughter. And if I'm being honest with you, I hadn't really thought of that much until this past weekend. Uh, I was in Katy, Texas, preaching at a disciple now, and I preach to students just like I preach to grown men. Uh, I, don't, I don't pull any, any punches. I believe that if, if I'm going to pull a punch, then the enemy's going to throw a punch. And so I try to throw a gospel punch as much as I can in a loving way. And so I was sitting back there realizing, you know, I bet you that a lot of these students don't really know what happened to Jesus. And then I sat down and I started reading through the Gospel of Mark. And I realized that I had forgotten what had happened to Jesus on the day of his death and on the day of his crucifixion. And we've got a lot of passages to look at tonight, and so I'm not going to ask you to stand while we read them all, but I am going to ask you to stand while we read one passage of Scripture, and then I'm going to have you to sit down, and we're going to walk through some things. We're going to look at what happened to him on the night of his crucifixion. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for me. Father, we love you. And Lord, I thank you so much that you love us and that you forgive us and that you take our sins and you wash them as far as it is to the east as to the west. God, you can take us and continue to use us even in our mess. And Lord, I pray that tonight we, a bunch of men, gathered here in Menden, Louisiana, at the Menden Civic Center, that you break our hearts in such a way that if some of us that are the hardest in this room will begin to sob and weep and cry when we realize what has happened to our Savior. Or there's many of us tonight that will cry over a flag, but we've never cried over the cross. God, there's many of us tonight that will point fingers out of other people's sin, but may tonight be the night that we see what our sin did to our Jesus and that he still came to pay the ransom for many. Lord, help me preach this in a way that honors you. I pray that I decrease and you increase, that you slow down time tonight. God, I pray that you protect our wives when we're away, protect those children when we're away from home as well. But tonight may be a night that we go home different dads, different husbands, different men. May tonight be the night that you change us all for the glory of God. Save the lost and revive the saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Be seated. What's well, interesting, what happens before the cross, they're in the, they're in the garden, right? And in Mark chapter 14, in verse 43, Jesus is in the garden, and he's already gone off and prayed a couple of times. And his three homeboys, Peter, James, and John, the ones that he went, took to the Mount of Transfiguration with him. They were his closest of the 12 disciples. They're in the garden with him, and Jesus has told them, hey, keep watch so the enemy doesn't sift you. Keep watch so the enemy doesn't deceive you. Jesus goes off to pray. The Bible even says, is that he prays so intently at one point that he is sweating drops of blood. He finds them asleep. I believe tonight that if Jesus was to return, he would find many of his men asleep instead of praying and preparing for his return. He finds them asleep. He goes back, continues to pray. Well, then in Mark 14, verse 43, immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, the Roman soldiers had shown up. They came accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Verse 44, now he who was betraying him. See what happened on that night before Jesus was carried to the cross? He was betrayed by somebody that was in his circle, by somebody that ate with him, by somebody that walked with him, by somebody that carried the money for him, by somebody that what he chose to be one of his 12 disciples. Jesus chose him knowing that he would betray him. And the first thing that happened on this night is that Jesus is betrayed by Judas, one of his 12 disciples. Says he betrays him, had given them a signal saying, Hey, whoever I kiss, that is the one. That is the one that you take. Because, guys, they didn't have Facebook. I know you, you mentioned that there's what the musicians go. Did you run when you called everybody old? Did he leave? Surely not. There he is. Yeah, he, I mean, he's then called you old, right? And so Facebook being the old person thing, but there was no Pictionary, there was no photo albums, there was no nothing. So some of these Roman soldiers had never laid eyes on Jesus before. And so he says, the one that I kiss, that is the one that you arrest. That is Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the one that is leading this rebellion. That is who you arrest. And so Judas shows up to Jesus, and the Bible says that he walks up and says, Rabbi, says teacher. 
So he betrayed him, and then he kissed him. See, I think a lot of us, sometimes we hear about Judas, and we're like, oh, I would never betray Jesus. I would never do that to Jesus. And then we use the same lips that Judas used to betray him. We use them to speak evil, not just about our brothers, but about this world as well. Do you know that the Bible tells us to handle people with gentleness and kindness? Can I just tell you this? God didn't call me to slay a giant. He called me to speak to the lost and tell them about our Savior named Jesus Christ. There's only been one person that ever slayed a giant with stones, and that was David. You're not David, but you are a follower of Christ, and you're not called to slay the giant. You're called to speak to people in a loving way and in kindness and in gentleness so that they might be set free from the bondage that the enemy has put on them. See, the night of his crucifixion, he was betrayed. And then he was kissed by one of his closest people. I wonder how many of us tonight could really identify as Judas. Well, then it goes on down into verse 50, because see, after he was betrayed and after he was kissed in verse 46, the Roman soldiers, they laid hands on him and they seize him. Now, I know many of you haven't been arrested in this room before. Let me just tell you, it's a joyous time, right? Like they treat you so nice and they are so gentle with those silver bracelets. Chris Plants, you were probably the most, you were probably like a gentle little kitten when you arrested people, right? Like, you no, know, no. When they arrest somebody that they think is leading a rebellion, they don't treat them with gentleness and kindness. And when it says that they laid hands on him, and they seized him. You can imagine these Roman soldiers running up to Jesus, the one that had healed the blind, healed the leopard, raised the dead, and made him walk out of a tomb. Lazarus, hello, right? The one that had done all these wonderful things. They lay hands on him, and they seize him. Not gently, but very aggressively. That's your Jesus. That's my Jesus. That's the Jesus of John chapter 3, verse 16 that we all love to quote. They are arresting him in a brutal way. And yet he uttered not a word. In verse 50, after Peter had pulled out his knife and cut off one of the, one of the Roman soldiers' ears, right? Peter, we all kind of can relate with him. We like to cuss, fight, carry a knife. Some of you need to repent of that. But Peter pulls out his knife, cuts off the ear. Jesus bends down, picks up the ear, says, Peter, put away your sword. Those that kill by the sword will die by the sword. Puts the dude's ear back on the side of his head. Imagine that for a moment, right? Some of your wives probably wish that your ears would get put back on the side of your head. But anyways... He says this, and then in verse 50, after being betrayed by Judas, Judas, kissed by Judas, after having hands laid on him by the Roman soldiers, in verse 50, it says, and they all left him, and they fled. There wasn't one disciple left in the garden. They all left him, and they all fled. Because it's real easy for us as men to talk like we're big and bad and no matter what happens, man, we're going to stand tall and we're going to stand strong. But these disciples had spent three years walking with Jesus, eating with Jesus, being in the same room and home as Jesus. And when it got heavy and when it got hard, they all betrayed him. Yet guess what he didn't do? He didn't betray them. Because at any moment when he saw them running away, one of them ran away butt naked because the people reached out and grabbed his cloak and he just ran out of his clothes. That's how scared, he didn't care about being humiliated, he just didn't want to die. And he runs away in all humiliation, leaving his Jesus behind. Jesus had been betrayed by his disciple, had been kissed by his disciple, had had hands laid on him by Roman soldiers, and now all of his disciples they have left him. They drag Jesus into the place of the high priest, into the temple where there's a trial going on that should have never happened, but they did it at night because they knew if they did it in the middle of the day, then it wasn't going to be able to happen. So they come up with these false accusations about Jesus because they could not find anything worthy to have him crucified and arrested for. So they had to lie about the things that he was doing. Well, while all of that is happening, Peter, one of his closest disciples, you know, the one that cut off the ear, the one that stepped out of the boat, the one that had so much faith that he had his mother-in-law healed right now that takes a lot of faith Peter finds himself outside of the temple warming up by a fire and you know the story one young girl comes up to Peter and says hey you're a Galilean I can tell that you follow Jesus he said no mm -mm, didn't know him mm -mm, no don't know him 
One of them comes back by and says, I know that you, I've seen you with him. He says, man, I don't know what you're talking about, right? And then another person comes up and some passages say that he cursed at the individual and said, I do not know this man. And then in Mark chapter 14, verse 72, the Bible says immediately a rooster crowed a second time and Peter remembered how Jesus made the remark before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me. He's betrayed. He is beaten by the Roman soldiers. He is left by all of his disciples. And now one of his closest disciples has denied him. And yet he still utters not a word. Men, can I just tell you this before we go any further? I don't know if you've betrayed Jesus. I have. I don't know if you've denied him. I have. I don't know if you have left him and ran away as fast as you can because things got hard. I have in my own personal life. And I'm so thankful to know that the God that I serve, even though I've betrayed him, he's never betrayed me. Even though I have denied him, he has never denied me. Even though I've left him, he has never left me. See, the God that we serve, doesn't matter what we do as fall. Can I just say this in a way that I hope that you hear? When we are followers of Christ, we have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. We we have been sealed by his signet when we are calling out Abba Father there's no height no depth that can separate us from the love of God there's no angel there's no demon that can pluck us from his father's hand there's no sin that you can do as a follower of Christ that he will say never mind don't want him because of what he did that night on Calvary folks if you can lose your salvation I lost mine today but because of what he did on the cross, I am sealed by his blood and his righteousness. And on this day, he was betrayed, he was beaten, he was drug away like a rebel, he had a false trial come up against him, and yet he still uttered not a word. In Mark chapter 15, verse 12, Pilate had already gotten Jesus and because they took him from the high priest temple to Pontius Pilate because they wanted to crucify him. They wanted to kill him. They hated him so much that they wanted to see his blood spilled out. They didn't care what it cost. They didn't care if Barnabas was gonna get released. They did not care. They take him to Pontius Pilate. They put him up in front of Pilate and they say, hey, this guy is against Rome. He needs to be crucified. He's led a Rebellion. He claims to be a king of the Jews. Take this man and crucify him. And in verse 12 of chapter 15, Pilate answering the high priest, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? Verse 13, they shouted back, Crucify him. Crucify him. And all of these people that are shouting this had seen Jesus do some incredible things. It'd be my, like me pulling up a veteran and saying, hey, what do, you, what, what do you want me to do with this person that's fought for your country, that's bled and died for the flag? What do you want me to do with him? And all of you yelling, kill him. See, some of you, you just had your heart sink more about that than you did about when I said Jesus had them yelling, crucify him. Praise God for our veterans. And praise God for the men and women that fought for this country. But please don't get it twisted. When you care more about a person than you care about what happened to Jesus, you are in a place where you need to repent and grow closer, that much closer to Jesus. He said, crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. And he uttered not a word. Pilate continues and said to them, why, what evil has he done? What wrong has this man done that you want me to crucify him? What wrong? What bad things has he done? I've heard that he's healed the blind. I've, I've heard, heard that I've heard, heard he's done all these wonderful things. And what, what do you want me to do with him? him? And, and they, they continue, continue to shout. Disciples. Now, now all of these people that he's done incredible things for, that they have seen miracles done for, they have heard wonderful preaching from him, and now they're shouting, crucify him. Pilate says in verse 15, wishing to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them and having Jesus scourged. 
you're grown men, so you can handle a little blood, guts, and glory. You have Chris Plants that lead your ministry. You probably hear all kinds of things. But there's never been another person on the face of this earth that has ever been beaten in the way that Jesus was beaten that day. If you don't know about a Roman scourging, they would have taken him. How many of you ever got told to go to the whipping post? Your whipping post was a Chuck E. Cheese compared to the whipping post that Jesus went to. They would have taken Jesus and they would have bound his hands on that whipping post and they would have stretched him out so that his skin would have been tight. These Roman soldiers that would have made Dwayne the Rock Johnson look like a little bitty shrimp would have walked up and grabbed a cat of nine tails is what they would call it. It would have leather straps coming off the end of it. Many people believe that they would have dipped it in some kind of blood or something to make it sticky and then would have dipped it in some metal balls, pieces of bone maybe even some pieces of, of metal glass or anything that would rip a human flesh to shreds. And they would have taken a step back and they would have stripped Jesus naked. He didn't have on a garment like we see in the movies. He would have been naked. And they stepped back and they knew that they had 39 lashings to hit this one man. And that if they didn't cause havoc and if they didn't cause severe pain to him, and if their leader wasn't satisfied with what they did to Jesus, then they would have been tied to the whipping post. And then they would have received the same beating. And so they would have grabbed that whip with all of their might, and they would have begun to beat Jesus. The one that came to pay the ransom for many, the one that stretched out his hand to the leper and said, I am willing, be clean. The one that stretched his hand out to the man that's been having an affair and says, I forgive you, be clean. The one that stretches his hands out to the man that's addicted to porn and says, I am willing to cleanse you, be clean. The one that stretched his hand out to a drug addict alcoholic and said, I am willing, be clean. That is the bare back that they would have started with. And they would begin to beat Jesus. Full force, man. Not some little like we hit our 18 month old they would have wanted Jesus to die with every swing of the whip I believe that after the back was beaten probably about 10 swings they would have turned him to his side after probably about 5 swings there they'd have turned him on over and they would have exposed his stomach I believe they'd have whipped him all the way down his thighs and his calves and his toes I believe they would have been swinging that whip in such a way they didn't care what it hit as long as it hit Jesus. He was betrayed. He was denied. He was beaten on the way to the false trial. All of his disciples left him. And now the people that he's been ministering to for all these years are shouting, crucify him. And now these Roman soldiers are beating him. But it doesn't stop. It continues. It says that he handed him over to be crucified. Verse 16, the soldiers took him away into the palace, into the innermost part. They called together all of the Roman soldiers. Every soldier that was there on duty would have been there. They dressed him in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews. They kept beating his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling and bowing before him. And after they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off of him and put his own garments on him and they led him out to crucify him. When they would have been beating him, some of the gospels say that they blindfolded him and they would smack him upside the head and say, prophesy, who hits you, who hits you? And here's the kicker of it. He knew exactly who was hitting them and he was still willing to die for that person's sin. You gotta catch this. He knows the sins that you've done. He knows the lies that you've told. He knows the shady deals that you've done. He knows the hatred that you have for people that don't look like you, sound like you, worship like you, act like you. He knows everything. And he still took all of those beatings for you to pay the ransom for many. They would have beat him. They would have put the crown of thorns on him. These weren't some little briars that you find out in the Louisiana swamp. These things would have been an inch and a half to two inches long. They would have gone into his skull and possibly started to come out. They were beating that on top of his head. The purple robe that they put on him, they were mocking him saying, if this guy's really royal, then let's make him royal because purple was the color for royalty. Now you have to keep in mind, his body is shredded from head to toe. All of these scars would have been drying up on this purple robe and the Bible says that they took the robe and they snatched it off of him opening those wounds back up Jesus was betrayed by his closest 
one of his closest disciples. Jesus was beaten on the way to a false trial by the Roman soldiers. Jesus was left high and dry by all of his disciples. He was denied by one of his closest disciples. He was lied about by people he'd been ministering to for many years. He was taken in front of Pontius Pilate and heard all these people that he had preached to shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. The Roman soldiers scourged him. The Roman soldiers mocked him and spit on him and said, hail king of the Jews. Then they put his garments back on him and they put the cross on him and they led him to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull where he would be crucified. Verse 22, then they brought him to the place of Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And verse 24, and they crucified him and divided up his garments and gambled over him for lots. This is Jesus. I don't know if you understand the heaviness of this. I hope that you do. See, we don't just come here to sing wonderful songs and to eat wonderful gumbo because we're from Louisiana and that's what we do when it gets cold. We just don't come here to sit in comfortable chairs behind these tables. We come here. We are allowed to come here because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. Because of the blood that was shed that day, you and I are able to have freedom. Because the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. If the cross didn't really happen, I was not forgiven of my sins. If Jesus did not bleed on the way to the cross, then I was not forgiven of my sins. If Jesus didn't die on that cross, then I would have no hope in eternity because he came to pay the ransom for many. And men, I think we have done a horrible job at remembering what Jesus Christ did for us because we sure don't show it in the way that we live, in the way that we act, in the way that we treat our wives, in the way that we treat our co-workers. We don't show that Jesus died for us. We show that Jesus should have done that. We don't care that Jesus had all that happen to him because it doesn't show in our lives. Many of us, we see a cross and we begin to nitpick the carpentry in it. Oh, they should have cut the arm bars just a little longer. Oh, they should have made it a little bit taller. They should have done this, they should have done that. Many of us, can I, can I just say this in a way, and I, and I hope you don't hear, I hope you hear this in a way of love. You have more compassion and more affection towards a country that may not be here in the next 10 years than you do for what happened for your souls and the souls of all humanity. He was crucified for you. The ransom was paid for you. He died for you. They beat him, they mocked him, and they crucified him for you. Can I ask you this, man? What have you done for Jesus Christ today? I don't care about what you've done in the past couple of years. What did you do for him today? Did you serve him with everything that you had? Because he served you with everything that he had on this day. Were you willing to lay down your own life to die yourself and pick up your cross and follow him because he was willing to lay down his life and pick up your cross and take it and be nailed to your cross and held to that cross for you? What did you do for Jesus today? Sure, you came to a men's event. Praise the Lord. But how many lost people know that you came here and worshiped here tonight? What will you do for Jesus because of what he's done for you? Can I just be honest with you? I fall short at things for Jesus many days of my life, but after reading this, and after preaching this, and after understanding this, that he paid my ransom, that he shed his blood for me, that he laid on that cross for my sins, so that the sinner might be saved, because who the Son sets free is free indeed, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and because of the crucifixion, and because of the blood that was shed, and because of what he did for me, I get to live for him today. I don't have to go back to who I used to be, because God has never called me a crackhead. God's never called me a meth head. God never called me an alcoholic. God never called me a womanizer. When I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, you know what he called me? Son. Because of the blood that his son shed on the cross. I hope you catch this tonight, man. This is so much more than just a monthly gathering. This is so much more than just a men of courage. This is a lifestyle that we get to live because of what Jesus Christ did for us. He was betrayed. 
He was denied. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was crucified. And he died. He was laid in a borrowed tomb. They put guards all around that borrowed tomb. But three days to the moment, that stone was rolled away, baby. And when that stone was rolled away and Jesus walked out of there, he's not, he walked out of there and he was around for a little bit and then he was ascended back into heaven where he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And our Bible says that he is our advocate, wishing that no one should sin. But if we do, he is our advocate seated at the right hand of the Father. You know what that means? The one that was betrayed by us, the one that was denied by us, the one that was crucified by our family, the one that all those things happened, he now fights for us because he died for us so that we might come to him repenting of our sins, surrendering our life to him, and serving him. He fights for us because one day, baby, he is coming for us. And if you're not careful, you will miss it because you hadn't surrendered to it because you're just going with the flow, baby. Hey, can I just tell you this? He died for you not so that you would play games. Not so that you would try to make everybody think that you're some godly person. The Bible says, do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. What a man sows, that he will also reap. If you sow that of the flesh, you will reap that of the flesh, which is destruction. But if you sow that of the Spirit of God, you will reap that of the Spirit, which is righteousness in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, he was betrayed. He was denied. Everybody left him high and dry. He was beaten. He was hung on a cross, and he died. But then he rose again, and he is seating at the right hand of the Father and one day he is coming back for his children and he's not coming back bearing a cross, he's coming back bearing a sword, he's not coming back to die again, he's coming back to get us so that we will never die, he is not coming back to let people beat him, he is coming back to get those that have surrendered to him my question to you when that day happens, what's going to happen to you? will you be called up with us or will you be left behind? Because if you're not careful, that'll be your story. Or your story could be like mine. On the day of November 2nd of 2014, I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. There was no pastor, but there was a master. There was no aisle for me to walk, but there was a God for me to surrender to. And there was a Holy Spirit that came and dwelled in me and changed me. You can deny my experience, but you can't deny the evidence of change in my life. So my question to you, man, two of them, what are you doing with Jesus? And are you a servant of Jesus? Because if you're not, he was betrayed, he was denied, he was mocked, and he was crucified. And he died, and he rose again, so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Won't you come to Jesus? Would you pray with me? Lord, I, I thank you for tonight. God, and I pray that men hear about the blood that was shed by Jesus. I pray that they hear about the cross. I pray that they hear all of these things. And Lord, I pray that they see that that was done for them. God, that they were not left out of that. That if the cross can't cover their sins, then the cross isn't the cross. That if the blood of Jesus can't cover their sins, then his blood wasn't enough, but it is. And this is a ransom for many. So God, I pray that if there's any man here tonight that is lost, that this will be the day that they cry out to you. This will be the day that they make it right with you. This will be the day that they surrender it all to you, Jesus. God, I pray for the followers of Christ in here. Maybe the ones that have forgotten about the cross. We get so wrapped up in our denomination and so wrapped up in our religion that we forget that this is a lifestyle that this is eternal. This is, just isn't seasonal, it's eternal. And yeah, there's gonna be shortcomings and yeah, there's gonna be things happen, but the God that we serve is a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness. So God, I pray that Christians in here tonight, myself included, maybe we've forgotten about the cross and maybe we've forgotten that you were betrayed and that you were denied and that you were hung on the cross. Maybe we forgot all those things. Maybe this is the night that you reminded us what happened so that we can become followers of Christ. Lord, may we never forget our salvation. May we never stop sharing our story. Because the Bible says that they'll be set free by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies. Lord, I pray that you move in this place. They're going to sing. 
And I don't want this just to be a normal time of response or invitation. I, I don't really like how we get so wrapped up in singing a few songs, do some preaching and, and whatever, man. We put the Spirit of God in such a box. Man, maybe tonight that God spoke to you through His Word. And maybe you need to go to somebody in this room and ask them to forgive you. I'm going to tell you, you better do it in humility and privately before He humiliates you publicly to do it. Maybe tonight you need to just simply leave and go home to your wife and ask her to forgive you. Maybe you need to go to your kids. Maybe tonight you're lost and the Holy Spirit is drawing you saying, I did that for you on the cross, for you, for your sins, so that you might become my child. Lord, I pray that if that's them tonight, that they cry out to you. But man, whatever needs to happen, when they sing, you just handle business between you and the Lord. Father, move in this place. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand? Oh, Lord, I can't even 
could walk without you holding my How are y'all doing tonight? Thank y'all singers. We appreciate it very much. When, when y'all said y'all were going to play some oldies, Tommy Davis and Paul Kitchen said, thank God. <laughs> Jim Wallace didn't say that. So one of the things, you know, Luke was talking about, and, and I have said this forever but I don't do it. How bold would it be if we were bold enough to go up to one stranger a day and ask them, do you know Jesus and have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? How, how bold would you have to be to do that to one stranger a day? Chris has told us about, you know, that people, he, he's gone to a lot of events and people come up and they'll say, he'll ask them, do you know Jesus? Yeah, I know Jesus. Well, have you ever asked him to come into your heart? No, I've never asked him. You've got to ask. So if anybody in this room has not ever asked, you've got to ask Jesus to come into your heart. So be bold enough to do it and do it tonight because you never know when you have a, don't have a chance. So Chris, uh, you were talking about some of your training that you do where they make you go into these things and they, they take you out and they give you coordinates and all like that, and you act like that's hard. <laughs> you, you ought to have to go through Subway Sandwich Artist School. <laughs> after, after you've learned to make about 25 sandwiches and you think you've got it, they introduce a new one. And geez, you gotta start all over. But Chris, Chris you've, uh, like say, you know, you, you, you admit you've made a few mistakes last year, and, and we don't, that's all past, but we're still going to make fun of you. We're not going to stop. I want y'all to look at Chris and look at Kevin. Kevin had the nerve to ask Chris the other day, aren't you the poster child for Christ Fit Jim? I, I think we need a new model. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, so, no, it won't not be you, Kevin. So, uh, so one day, uh, Chris tells uh, Lane Hedrick that he said, I'm sorry, man, I'm not going to be able to make one of your ramps. Will you be okay? And Lane didn't say nothing for a second. And he looked at Kevin, he goes, I mean, uh, at Chris, and he goes, I'm trying to think what I'm going to miss by you not being here. So, so, so Chris, we're, we're going we're gonna to keep the pressure on, okay? Uh, we've got uh, a few door prizes. Uh, also, we're, we're giving away two tickets. We're going to actually give away three tickets tonight. The, the first door prize that I'm going to do is uh, for... I, the last year's, what week are we on, Kevin? We're on week 49. We're on week 49, and we're gonna, uh, Lane's going to bring the ticket to you, and we're going to put your name in tonight, uh, and you'll be in the drawing tonight for that one. And then we're going to give away a ticket as a door prize for the next one. And then if you bought a ticket tonight, you got your name in for 
a drawing for another one for next time. So we'll draw three of those. Uh, so I'm going to draw first. I'm going to draw uh, for the this week's draft uh, raffle so Lane can get you the ticket and we can get it in. Number 825268. 825268. Anybody? Man. Kevin, it was me. Go ahead and put me in. Jeez. 825286. Raymond, okay. Um, Right in, Lane, you don't got to walk far. Look at that. Okay, if you'll get that one in. All right, the next uh, drawing is for the next, uh, the drawing for the next year's raffle. 825318. Okay, uh, just get, see Kevin. Uh, uh, Gary Swanson's got it in the back. You can get it on the way out. Okay, the, the next one is if you bought a ticket tonight, we put, your, uh, we put a ticket in for a drawing for you to get another uh, ticket tonight, too, so uh, Gary will have that as well. So if this is not your pink ticket. This is your red ticket. 312623. Anybody? 318 623 red ticket. Okay. I'm going to do it again. 312652. George? George Byron. Well, he, he won a chance to win something. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, we've also got two door prizes from uh, Rowney Beach and Anti-Pest. The first one is a snake repellent. Okay. That is number 825245. Buddy Clayton, you got you some snake repellent. Also, we have a mosquito trap. Okay. Eight two five two eight three. Anybody? Eight two five two eight three. Some of y'all weren't keeping up with your tickets. Okay. Uh, eight two five three one nine. Eight two five three one nine. You want to? Okay. Congratulations. You won your mosquito trap. The. I'm going to draw for that in just a minute, but I want y'all to know that we have some gumbo to go, a few uh, left over. That is free with the purchase of another ticket. So if you'll purchase a ticket, you can get you a gumbo to go for free. I'm just kidding. You can have your gumbo to go for free. Whoever's fast enough to get over there first. All right, what is this for, Kevin? So, so, so we're going to, Kevin always makes fun of me for the way, oh God, this is week, this is week 40, 49. Yeah, week 49. So, I don't hunt a whole lot, and I don't know a whole lot of guns, um, but uh, this is for a Koenig 9mm pistol, is that right, Kevin? I'm going to, I'll tell you how much I hunt. I'm going to bring a Subway sandwich platter to the Beast Feast. Okay. Oh, man, this guy needs a gun bad. Mike Leppert. Mike Leppert is my next-door neighbor, and if we ever get attacked, all I have to do is make it to Mike's house, and I am protected. All right, guys, that's all the door prizes. Uh, we really appreciate y'all uh, coming out uh, with the, the bad weather. We want to get our numbers back up, 
and we just really appreciate it. Tommy Davis is holding up the red buckets. Don't forget to uh, uh, contribute on the way out if you feel like it. And Chris, I'm going to let you do the closing prayer, okay? Thank you all very much for coming. Hey, man, thank you all so much for coming, battling the weather, being brave enough to come. Kay, that was unbelievable singing, man. It was so good. Luke, thank you, brother, for talking for Jesus tonight, man. Um, February, Beast Feast. How we talk about at Christmas, how easy it is to talk about Jesus at Christmas because that's what it's, that's the only reason we have Christmas because of Jesus, right? So, Beast Feast in February, how easy is it to talk to your brother, your worker, about, hey, man, you got some of that backstrap you've been talking about? Well, I'm doing it in the Civic Center. Easy way to transition into God Jesus. So, do me a favor, and I want a whole pig from you to come over with an apple in its mouth. You know, one of them things. But do me a favor, it's going to all work out. Um... Uh, my brother Brian still he's so organized he's got to have every little number and every little spot but it's going to work out perfect so uh, y'all bring what y'all got and uh, and if nothing else we'll eat Subway sandwich okay I love y'all uh, y'all strengthen me so much come back in February bring your partner that maybe possibly don't know about Jesus maybe ain't moved a long time closer to Jesus with some backstrap next month, okay? Here we go. Lord God Almighty, Lord in heaven, God, thank you so much for these brave, bold, courageous Christian men that walked up in here tonight, God, to worship you, God, to hear about your son, Jesus, God. Thank you for the way Luke translated that, God, to us about Jesus dying on the cross. We do. We put so much uh, above that that we should not. We should just think about that all the time. Jesus, you dying for us. You dying for us. You dying for us. And, uh, man, forgive me for not thinking about it enough. Jesus, bless these men as they go about their night, they go about their day tomorrow. Bless their wives, bless their children, bless their children's children, bless their finances, bless their health, God. Help us with our mental health, God. Forgive us where we feed you, Jesus. We do thank you. Being God's son, coming to this earth freely of your own will and dying on the cross for us who are horrible. Thank you for that, Jesus. In your name we pray.